Um, and I want to start off with Keynote 42. So Keynote 42 is a study looking at stage four incurable lung cancer, where our goals of care are extension of duration of life and preservation of quality of life. In the time that the study was designed, the standard of care is what you're looking at at bottom, uh, histology defined platinum-based doublet chemotherapy. So when I say doublets, I mean uh, a platinum drug, ideally carboplatin if you like your patient, combined with a partner agent, most commonly um, attacking in, in squamous disease, and most commonly chemotrexid in non-squamous disease. So this was a randomized study uh, between the challenger, pembrolizumab, also uh, known as Keytruda for those who like brand names, or MK3475 for those who are nerds. Um, critically, no crossover was allowed. Um, and this was conducted in places in the world where you wouldn't expect de facto a crossover to pembrolizumab or related agents, uh, which can accentuate uh, any survival advantage shown a little bit, and especially when we compare it to other uh, studies that did a lot of crossover. And in the overall population, we see a win here. We see a 20% improvement in survival with the use of pembrolizumab compared to chemotherapy. And critically for human purposes, at what docs call the tail of the curve, um, we have more patients alive here now at three years with pembrolizumab compared to chemotherapy, a theme that you're probably familiar with with immunotherapy. That's what makes these drugs inspirational, that and a more favorable toxicity profile. Now, from uh, a biologic perspective, in a sense, there were, there were multiple populations treated in Keynote 42. We don't entirely know scientifically how to break those out. Um, the best we really can do for the most part is this biomarker called PDL1. Let me put it out there up front. PDL1 is a lousy biomarker. It helps some, but it's not what we would ideally want from a biomarker. So some of you may know about targeted therapy. Right? We'll talk more about it a little later in the talk. But targeted therapy are cancer pills. So if like a lock and a key model, you, mit, you match target with targeted therapy. I'm talking about targets like EGFR, ALF, ROS1, you may have heard of. As a theme, you get treatments that are more likely to work, that tend to work longer, that have fewer side effects than chemotherapy, and of course demedicalized treatment because they're pills instead of IVs, right? That's a good biomarker, right? If you give an EGFR mutated patient an EGFR targeted therapy, it's almost certainly going to work. It's near 100% gets some benefit out of it. If you give that same therapy to a patient without that biomarker, it's like diarrhea-inducing placebo. It does nothing, right? That's a good biomarker. If you're the patient or the doc, you know exactly what to do with that biomarker. pd one helps some, but it is imperfect, as you will see over the next several slides. Nonetheless, it does help some. And you see that here. Population at top, those with a high pd one Prior to this data, we were already treating with pembrolizumab alone. Prior to ASPO, you already knew that. And we see here why that founding is nicely reinforced. Median survival of 20 months compared to 12.2 and starting with chemo. And perhaps uh, equally importantly, looking at this tail, a better tail with pembrolizumab compared to chemotherapy. If you look at the patients who express PD1, PD1 positive but lower expression, 1 to 49%, we see a different story. Here we do not see an improvement with pembrolizumab compared to chemotherapy. For survival, they come even. Now, if this uh, now if this data existed in isolation, in isolation of what I'm going to show you next, um, this would be a clear winner in my mind, um, because while survival is similar, toxicity is lesser with pembrolizumab. Um, but you're actually seeing a unique pattern here. It's a pattern. It's not that unique. We've seen it many times over the last decades in thoracic research. But you see crossover, right? Early on, chemo does better. Later on, pembro does better. Um, that could speak to the more rapid action of chemotherapy when it worked, but it could also speak to heterogeneity of population, that there's a population with low biomarker who derives tremendous benefit from pembro and does better on it, and a population that doesn't derive benefit that is better off getting guaranteed exposure to chemo early. And we're still working hard on uh, figuring that out. But this is the data that needs to be thought of, of why 42, the last data, doesn't exist in isolation. Here you're looking at a study for squamous lung cancer patients, but a similar study was conducted in non-squamous with near identical findings, so I just present one of them to you as a principle. And here what we have is we have chemotherapy versus chemo plus pembrolizumab. Or in case I slip into doc talk, doublet, two drugs, both chemo, or triplet, 
doublet chemo plus the third drug, in this case, pembrolizumab. Here, crossover was allowed. <coughs> and here's what happened. At top, you see progression-free survival curve. So everyone is alive and without progression uh, at the beginning of uh, the curve. And any time a patient's cancer grows, um, or that a patient dies, the curve kick, ticks downward. And what you see here in blue is the pembrolizumab curve. So when you add pembrolizumab to chemo, you get a 44% uh, progression-free survival advantage over chemo alone. And if you want to simplify this a little bit, you could see this as a cancer control curve. At bottom, you have the survival curve with a 36% survival advantage when you add pembrolizumab to chemotherapy. Now the logical question to ask next is what about the biomarker, right? If it's worth something, how do things divide out? The quick and dirty answer is that every patient population benefited from the addition of pembrolizumab to chemotherapy. So let's start it right. The population with high expression, here at top you see survival, at bottom progression-free survival, um, tremendous benefit, 36% improvement in survival, right? And look at that tail. That tail is over the 50% mark. That's inspiration. Now, a left unanswered is a question you might obviously ask me. Should the patient with high expression of pd one get Pembro alone or Pembro plus chemo? No answer to that question. In my personal practice, my average patient gets Pembrolizumab alone because of the human advantages of leaving, leaving out the chemotherapy. But I am open-minded when those studies are ultimately completed. If the chemo does add a large survival advantage, then it's something I'll talk about with patients. Nothing wrong with using triplet for everyone, but in my practice, for human reasons for this population, I'm going with Pembrolol. What about the 1 to 49? This is the population um, in the last uh, study that I said, well, if it existed in isolation, we'd switch to Pembrolol, but it doesn't. Here we have triplet, or chemo plus Pembro, handily beating chemo alone for this population. So with Pembro alone, we come even. With triplet, we have a win. That doesn't prove the difference because they're not all in one study with same populations. But nonetheless, it's the best data we have is triplet beating doublet. And in my practice, for a patient with a PDL one of 1 to 49%, who is fit and motivated, it's consistent with their values, et cetera, um, my standard is to recommend triplet. So chemotherapy plus Pembro is not. But here's an interesting population we haven't talked about yet in our time together. This is the biomarker negative population, a simpler way of saying less than one, and I probably should change the slide. Here, for both PFS and OS, we have triplet beating doublet. And that just comes to how lousy the biomarker is. There are patients with a pdl one of zero, or negative biomarker, who benefit from the use of this agent. How toxic is it to add pembrolizumab to chemotherapy? Not so much. It's additive, which is to say that if you look at the first and second line studies of pembrolizumab and similar drugs um, alone, and you basically added that toxicity to what you expect from chemo, that's what you got in this study and in a similar study for non squamous patients. And I would call it uh, quite acceptable for the survival advantage offered. What about quality of life? Quality of life, for the most part, in my patients is threatened by two things. Me, or less comically, because no one laughed, um, my chemotherapy <laughs> hurting them, my drugs hurting them, um, and their cancer, which hurts them, right? There are other drivers of quality of life, like other medical conditions, social concerns, spiritual concerns, but these are two dominant ones, at least, that drugs can modify. If we're talking about drugs today. Um, and it's better with the addition of the pembrolizumab. So, this is data from the phase one study of NK3475, now known as PEMBRA. At top, we have data uh, su uh, supplied at ASCO, looking at previously treated patients at right, some of them heavily treated, and treatment naive, meaning that PEMBRA was the first drug that they got. This is absolutely inspirational data. Five-year survival of 15.5% in pretreated patients. No one's excited to have a 15.5% survival, I'll grant you that. But if you compare that to the several percent we might have expected with standard therapies, that is impressive. And then if you look at five-year survival in treatment-naive patients, 23% living at five years when pembrolizumab was their first treatment. Again, 
I look forward to the day when we can offer our patients a lot better than a 23% chance of being alive in five years. But if you compare this to what came before, it's absolutely inspirational. And I'd like uh, to thank uh, one of my heroes and close friends, Eddie Guerin, for uh, providing some cleaner and more granular data all of hours ago um, to uh, supplement some obvious questions that you might ask, which is breaking these results down by the PDL1 score. Um, at left here, you're looking at treatment naive patients in the dark green um, with high PDL1, at least 50%, and the light green, low PDL1. So frontline Pembro, 16% uh, five year overall survival. In the low expressors, 30% in the high expressors. And we look at previously treated patients, of course the numbers tick downward, but I would say that that population is increasingly going to not exist anymore going forward. So this, to me, is an optimistic, and this, this is that glasses half full slide to me, right? On the optimistic side, look at how far we've come. Look at how much PD-1 inhibition offers our patients compared to what was possible before. Look at what might be possible. It also, of course, when we recognize what a poor number, 30% even, really is, it also shows us the work that we have left to do. So I apologize for the technical and busy nature of this slide. Um, I didn't have time to make a simpler version. But if I mentioned that PDL1 was a lousy biomarker before, this is the beginnings of what a better biomarker looks like. So there's some data that existed before this overly technical busy slide to say that patients with EGFR mutation and alpha gene rearrangement, and I would say now RET, um, derive substantially inferior benefit from PD-1 inhibitor. And the newest biomarker like this to come out was STK11, otherwise known as LKB1, or the same thing. Um, this is a mutation. So you find it by the same kinds of tests that you might find EGFR, ALK, ROS1, um, that was initially thought about as a checkpoint, uh, but is increasingly being uh, understood to also relate to antigen presentation, which is a critical component for immunotherapy to work. And what this data here summarizes, with apologies for the busyness of the slide, is that with single agent PD-1 inhibition, it's highly unlikely to work if the patient has LKP-1 in their cancer. <coughs> So in response to this data, I and many others quietly moved to using triplet for these patients, even if their PDL1 was very high. The idea behind doing that was that if there was any benefit from the PD1, given how new this data was and not replicated, then we guaranteed them benefit. And in case there isn't, the chemo is there to rescue them. What we saw at ASCO is uh, a strong argument against that strategy. Um, this data was sliced and diced many ways, but the summary of the finding is that single agent uh, doesn't do anything, um, uh, even in combination with chemo. So that for a patient with LKV1, adding uh, PD-1 inhibitor to chemo does not provide benefit to that patient. Now when we talked, why, why does this data matter? Why do I think this is inspirational as opposed to depressing? There are two major reasons. One is that while the, these agents may have a very acceptable toxicity profile, particularly when considered in light of what they can offer patients for benefit, they do hurt people sometimes. These drugs can hurt people sometimes dramatically. You're not supposed to ever say that from the podium, but we're all friends here, so I'll break that taboo. Um, the other thing is, so for the patients who aren't going to benefit, you, you avoid that risk for them. But the other thing is, if you think about it, if there's a population in our, in our overall pool, if there's a population who's not benefiting and you pull those folks out, it means for those without this mutation, the benefit is even larger than you previously thought. So this is really about getting drug to those who it's going to benefit and avoiding it for those that it's going to not. And I look forward to more such markers that could really refine for us who we're helping the most. So on to targeted therapy. Um, that's my segue uh, into mutations. So you all may know, um, sorry Tammy, I'm not a proper southerner yet, I didn't say you all. You all <laughs> may know um, the data on EGFR, ALP, ROS1, um, mentioned earlier about how wonderful targeted therapy is. In general, we expect a two-thirds response rate with targeted therapy when we have that proper match. We expect duration of 10 to 20 months, depending on 
uh, the, the selectivity and potency of the inhibitor. Again, recognizing, congrats, you'll get 20 months on this isn't great, but also recognizing how much better that was than what came before. And we know that we have FDA approves for EGFR, which represents about 15% of adenocarcinoma, ALK, which represents about 4%, ROS1, which represents about 2%, uh, and now NTRAC, which is less than 1%. RET is a new gene rearrangement that accounts for about 2% of adenocarcinoma of the lung, and you're looking here at data for one of the two drugs targeting it called BLUE667. BLUE667 has a relatively clean kinome profile, um, maybe not quite as clean as its competitor, uh, but certainly very clean compared to most targeted therapies. Perhaps as a consequence, if we look at the um, side effects, um, it was a, 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 a pretty favorable profile. And up top you see the waterfall plot. So waterfall plots represent growth of cancer for anything north of the zero line and shrinkage for anything south. Um, the depth of it represents the percent shrinkage by this messed up system called resist. It's standard, it's mandatory to use it, but it has its weaknesses. And so what you have here is a patient with a slight shrinkage, down here patients with 100% shrinkage. This is a beautiful waterfall plot, um, and very much the kind of shape that we expect from true targeted therapy. Response rate of about 60% uh, percent here. And so it looks like RET will be uh, druggable, and there'll probably be at least two new FDA-approved RET inhibitors within the next year or so. So some may say, okay, that's 2% of lung cancer. That's nice, but move on to something that affects more people. Fine, I will. KRAS. KRAS affects 25% of adenocarcinoma of the lung. To put that in perspective, KRAS is more common than EGFR, ALK, and ROS1 combined. It's the, one of the first oncogenes to be known. There have been trials trying to drug it since about the dawn of the internet, and they have been a graveyard. They have not worked, one after another after another. KRAS has multiple isoforms. Uh, making the problem a little bit trickier. But in lung cancer, the most common of these is called KRAS G12C. It's about half, a little over half, of KRAS in the lung. On an absolute basis, that means that G12C KRAS represents about 13% of adenocarcinoma. So just slightly, this one isoform, slightly less common than EGFR. And we now have two drugs that are potent KRAS G12C inhibitors in clinical trials. At ASCO, we saw data on AMG510, a very potent and selective inhibitor. That selectivity is shown nicely in this uh, toxicity uh, chart here. Uh, very minimal toxicity, cleaner even than most TKIs um, out there. And of course, this matters nothing unless it works. Um, we saw 10 patients um, where five of them had a response. Response, I'll remind you, being defined by an at least 30% shrinkage by that messed up resist system. Of note, this was a phase one study. So if you look at the small print on the color coding here, it's the dose the patients received. And so with these small numbers and the fact that many of these patients were not treated at full dose, I have some hope that this response rate will drift upwards as more patients at full dose are represented over time. Exxon 19 and 21 changes in EGFR are associated with dramatic sensitivity to EGFR inhibitors. In contrast, at least with first and probably second generation drugs, maybe, Exxon 20 insertions seem to be associated with resistance to these agents. TAC 788 was specifically designed to target these Exxon 20 insertions that are currently associated with resistance. Toxicity profile shown at bottom, maybe not quite as clean as some of the others I've shown you, but still um, quite superior to chemotherapy. And a beautiful waterfall plot. 43% response rate um, and uh, immaturity. And again, as we normally hope with phase one studies, we hope that perhaps this will drift upward over time. Mentel 14. Mentel-14 represents about 4% of adenocarcinoma of the lung. Um, right now, it is sometimes actioned with crizotinib off-label. Uh, we participated in the study that produced the data on crizotinib um, in uh, Mentel-14, the largest phase one ever conducted in oncology. It was the same study that got crizotinib uh, approved for uh, EML4-ALK and ROS1. 
Um, but the results really were uh, somewhat unimpressive in that study. It showed activity, it's used as an option, but not typically as a frontline option now. And if you look at the IC50s here, you can see why. So IC50 is a measure of how potent a drug is against its target. And you want a small number, not a big number here. So crizactin is active against target, but not wonderful. And what we have now are new drugs, catmatinib, sevalitinib, tapotinib, that are far more potent against target. And if you look at the kinome profile here, I apologize, it's a little smaller, um, quite a bit cleaner than a drug like crizactin. And here's the data. At left, you're looking at second and third line treated patients, and at right, you're looking at frontline patients. These are beautiful waterfall plots. I may be spoiling you guys with Niagara Falls after Niagara Falls, but like what we're used to in oncology for decades is like a little stream kind of going downhill a little bit, not these massive responses with most people benefiting and most of the non-responders having some benefit. There's no regression discontinuity, or if you prefer plain English, magic at 30%. Right? Patients with a 29% shrinkage and a 31% shrinkage do not derive meaningfully different benefit. They just did, years ago had to set the bar somewhere so that you could compare drug A to drug B to drug C. So this is absolutely beautiful. So many deep responses, and of most of the uh, non-responders, not being patients with growth, but just a smaller degree of benefit in these immature curves. Um, this, this suggests that metdel 14 really is actionable. Here are the PFS curves. Um, you're looking uh, for heavily pretreated patients at five and a half months, which I would say, frankly, not good enough for targeted therapy, but you're doing a bit better in the frontline patients here now getting uh, to 10 months. Safety uh, is pretty favorable, um, not side effect free, uh, but again, handily beating chemotherapy. And I'm happy to share for slides for anyone who wants to dig in because I am summarizing a little bit as I fly through these. Tapotinib is another similarly very effective drug. Here you're looking at first, second, and third line data on it, all uh, looking uh, quite effective, looking like targeted therapy, similar to the data we saw before. Just a different drug. PFS, um, again, uh, in the 10 to 12 month range, depending on whether you're looking at liquid or tissue biopsy, fairly similar, I would say, here. Again, strengthening the idea conceptually that MedDel 14 is actionable, right? That you, any of you who have attended a lung cancer talk before, it's almost mandatory to represent these mutations as like a pie chart. The unknown portion of that pie chart just keeps shrinking down and down and down and down, and more and more is becoming actionable. Safety looks very similar to what you saw with catmatinib. Happy to share slides for anyone who wants to dig into details. So right now, the FDA-approved drug for ROS1 is crizotinib. But uh, like its activity against ALK, and against, uh, particularly against NET, it's nearly not the most potent. Sorry. Sorry about that. So what you see here is again, these are the, um, you see IC50s again. When you look to a drug like Repotrectin, at bottom, you're seeing far greater potency against target than what you expect with, say, crizotinib, right? 3.3 versus 266.2. Far more potent drug. And what you see in the black here is potency uh, against uh, wild type, again, represented. What you want is to not be potent against wild type and be very potent against target, and you'd like to be much more potent against target than against um, uh, other uh, places in the kino. This is a very potent drug against um, target and against resistance changes, uh, so-called, doesn't matter what these are for the sake of our talk, solvent fragmentations. Here's how it works. Again, another beautiful waterfall plot. Um, most, the overwhelming majority of patients benefiting, and what's uh, interesting uh, in the smaller curves here are patients with brain mets having uh, uh, potency in the brain on par with what's happening in the body. And that's a characteristic that we're increasingly expecting from our targeted therapies. We're expecting them to work not just in the body, but in the brain, and we are seeing this here with repo. So I didn't think these findings were important enough to dedicate lots of time in their own slides to, and so I bullet them, because I think that um, at least the first two are more important for XUS practice right now in terms of potentially being practice changing, 
But I think that they're worth briefly talking about because they show where trials should go and what questions we need to ask to improve things. So Jafitinib and Erlotinib are first generation EGFR inhibitors. Right? They have both handily beat chemo and randomized studies for patients with EGFR mutation, but standard of care uh, in the US and much of the developed world has moved on from first generation to third generation inhibitors. Um, more specifically, since there's only one, osimertinib. Right? Pretty much most US patients, frontline EGFR, get osimertinib. Very potent drug um, with a, a very favorable toxicity profile. But nonetheless, we used to use drugs like Jafitinib and Erlotinib, and much of the world still does. First study came out of Mumbai, India. What they did was randomize EGFR mutated untreated non-small cell lung cancer, stage four, to the first generation drug Jafitinib, or to Jafitinib plus chemotherapy. Now, of course, this is not an exciting thing to do from a human perspective, right? You don't want to be using chemo in targeted therapy patients unless the advantage is large, right? Because one of the wonderful things we've talked about for years with these drugs is avoiding all the side effects of chemo. How large was the gain? It was actually pretty massive with first generation drugs. 49% improvement in PFS, or doubling at the median, and a 55% improvement in survival. So, like probably most of the room, I hate chemotherapy. Like probably most of the room, I look forward to uh, never using chemotherapy again. But, if when similar studies are done, if there is a randomized study done of osimertinib versus osimertinib plus platinum doublet that shows that I can offer my patient a 55% survival advantage, then this is what I'm going to recommend to fit patients whose values are compatible. And those studies are, are, are getting planned. Relay added something different to Erlotinib. Ramucirumab is a VEGF receptor blocker. It is FDA approved in combination with docetaxel in uh, second or third line treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. When I use docetaxel, I do always add ramucirumab to it, although topic for another day, I don't love docetaxel. At any rate, we have studies including um, uh, some uh, that we contributed to here comparing a related drug, bevacizumab, added to erlotinib that showed at least a PFS advantage. The survival advantage uh, has not so much materialized. That's a little controversial and I won't go into it. But here what we had in ASCO this year was erlotinib versus Earl plus remucirumab. We have a 40% improvement in PFS. We have a 30%, uh, I'm sorry, a 20% improvement in survival. And PFS2 here I find very interesting. So PFS2 is a measure invented by the EMA, the European Regulatory Agency that tries to get at the sequence effect with drugs. What PFS2 is, is the time from patient starts first drug to the time they progress or die on whatever comes after it. And what it gets at is, if you're trying to move a more potent drug to first or more aggressive treatment first, it gets at do you provide a long-term benefit to the patient or do you just window dress things in the short run? Um, and to me, it's consistent with this story that there's real benefit that the PFS2 is still favorable. So a patient who progresses on erlotinib, the 60% whose resistance change will be T790M can go on to osimertinib. Um, other patients can go on to chemotherapy. This suggests that their cancer control benefit, uh, consistent with the survival advantage, this tells a story that the benefit is long-lived, that it's not just a short-term window dressing. And so that's another exciting approach, and I'm aware of studies looking at osimertinib uh, with remucirumab. And finally, U3, was presented by one of my heroes, Passiani, um, who's sort of the opposite of Cher. You're obliged to get both of his names whenever you talk about him. Um, and um, he showed phase one data on a HER3 targeted drug. Um, it's a, co a combination drug with toxin. Think of it like a smart bomb um, that showed some impressive efficacy that we look forward to learning more about. So moving on to uh, one of my favorite uh, topics, small cell. And in this case, um, immunotherapy in small cell. Um, Lubronectidin um, is a drug uh, with pleiotropic mechanisms, uh, but um, perhaps most importantly, suppression of uh, myeloid-derived uh, suppressor cells, at least in my opinion. Where at ASCO, we saw um, real efficacy in small cell lung cancer. Tableau empowers everyone to see and understand. Sorry, sorry. See, that, that, that also excited about it. Oh, um, <laughs> with, you know, maybe not as impressive of duration. You're looking in gold at platinum sensitive patients, at blue refractory patients. Um, but keep in mind, this is small cell, right? This is, this is a disease that makes non-small cell look like fun. Um, 
Um, and so the idea that there's some activity here where the novel mechanism is meaningful, and ongoing studies uh, are looking at how to properly integrate and combine this drug to attempt to maximize efficacy. I would argue that it was one of two important findings in small cell, and usually there are none at ASCO. Here's the other one. So this is looking at decreasing the side effects of therapy. Um, chemotherapy for small cell is brutal. Heavy incidence of adverse events, but it actually does work for most patients. Response rates are very high, longevity not as much as we'd like. And one of the greater sources of toxicity are suppression of blood counts and the things that come along with that, like fatigue, blood transfusion, neutropenia <coughs> leading to infections. And what this study uh, is looking at is trying to reduce the incidence of blood count suppression with chemotherapy. We've uh, seen presented already data on the combination with carboplatin and atopicide. We've seen presented data on the combination of carbo, uh, atopicide and tezolizumab, and we've seen data in triple negative breast cancer uh, combined with gemcitabine and carboplatin, and they all show similar themes to what I'm going to show you today. And that is to say that you reduce the incidence of neutropenia, you reduce the incidence of anemia, um, and there are functional consequences to this with less febrile neutropenia um, and fewer transfusions, and quality of life, which is what we're really trying to get at, uh, is improved trended towards improved or similar for all important measures. Um, and so in the oncologic community, people um, who wear stethoscopes like me, this data was actually not that warmly received. Um, and by disclosure, I participated, so maybe it's a part of point of passion here. Um, and it was not so warmly per uh, perceived because it did not improve progression-free or overall survival, um, at least in this data set. Um, I would argue that that's very misguided. If you're improving quality of life, that is extremely meaningful. That is at least half the battle that we and our patients are fighting every day in the clinic. This did not come from ASCO, but it introduces nicely the data that's to follow that I want to talk about. Um, this was a New England Journal paper from over a year ago now. It was what was called a window of opportunity study. So window of opportunity is when you give a drug before surgery. But your major goal is not clinical efficacy, but rather biocorrelative specimens to understand how drug works and how to design future studies. So you give a small amount of drug to uh, altruistic volunteers, um, and you compare their initial biopsy specimen to the surgery that's being done anyway uh, to get important scientific knowledge. The first finding in this study was that there was an impressive clinical efficacy. It was only two doses of nivolumab, um, and there was a high rate, I think it was like 45%, of major pathologic uh, response or shrinking on the surgical specimen. Not at all what they designed for. But what was uh, really interesting was the data shown here. Um, so the more the predicted uh, neoantigens um, or foreign looking stuff for the immune system to potentially attack that the cancer had, the, the smaller the percentage of residual tumor after just two doses of nivolumab. And what's shown at bottom that I'll just summarize is data from the supplementary appendix that shows basically a viral pattern of immune response. For those of us who research how to use the immune system to attack tumors, we fantasize about approaching a viral level response. We had two pieces of data following doing very similar things with other agents. Here you're looking at data with a tezolizumab. The numbers for major path response are a bit lower, 19%, but still the point is the same. There was major efficacy with a minimal amount of drug. Neostar did something very similar with nivolumab, and again, impressive efficacy. A little less than the New England Journal paper with, um, uh, had shown, but still showing us what is possible. The reason I share this to you today is that I think this is major hope for our earlier stage patients. Um, I will make a prediction, I reserve the right to be very wrong, but I believe that once all the trials are done and everything is shake, has shaken out, that multiple PD-1 or PDL one drugs will be approved for the use in stage one through three disease. We already have Dervalumab with chemorads in stage three, and that the difference that these drug makes, these drugs make, will be much bigger than what chemotherapy offers. I think in terms of moving that cure rate up, um, it's gonna be more meaningful than chemotherapy that is now standard, and I think these three studies provide legitimate reason to believe that this hope may be realized. I end all of my talks other than very sober ASCO talks with a cute kids picture. Um, and here um, you have Betty, Dina, and the newest addition, um, Charlotte, um, who are being heavily pressured to either become cancer uh, immunologists 
I'm going to at least one of the advocates as they go. <laughs> so I'm happy to take any questions anyone has about this stuff or anything else lung cancer related. My question has um, nothing related to guess uh, what you discussed, well, related, but not any of the topics that you have talked about.